Uh, hello, I'm Kelly Dorn, an architect with Mass Design Group and a uh, visiting lecturer of landscape architecture at Harvard University's Graduate School of Design. This lecture, originally given at the Mine Tailings and Waste Conference in Banff, Alberta, uh, serves to create, an, I, I guess, a new perspective uh, or position um, for mine reclamation as it relates to the Athabasca oil sands. Titled Second Natures, uh, what I'm really hoping to, to set out here is ways to look at the future land uses of the Athabasca oil sands area. So to start with, let's, let's look at how people are currently talking about the region and its, and its landscape, specifically the province and how it sees itself as a global leader in the innovative, responsible and collaborative development of the oil sands. That the benefits of development will continue to support clean, healthy and vibrant communities for Albertans and future generations. I think what's important here is that the province already recognizes that what's going on right now needs to be in service of not only short term development, but ultimately a much longer term uh, plan or vision for, for itself and its landscape. To situate where we're talking about, uh, we're going to be primarily talking about the surface mineable area as shown in yellow here, which is the area of where, well, as, as, as named here, most of the mining that people are familiar with in the oil sands and the images that come out of it uh, reside within this area. And also the Athabasca oil sands area shown in red, which is the larger region that, that encompasses uh, basically all oil sands projects in situ and, and mining and other. But I think also importantly here, it's, it's, understand, uh, it's to understand the region as, as a part of a larger uh, system as well, and that being the boreal forest of, of northern Canada. Zooming out a little further, a third kind of perspective to look at this through is through Fort McMurray and ultimately the people that live and will live there. I think far too often we're not talking about the oil sands and the environment as being urban. And as you can see here, Fort McMurray now, and I would argue much more in the future, will have more in common with uh, Helsinki and Oslo than it will with Calgary and Toronto. So to begin looking at reclamation, how it's currently understood, I'm, I'm taking the language here from Golder. Uh, an industry leader and how they define it as uh, achieving maintenance-free self-sustaining ecosystems with capabilities equivalent to or better than pre-disturbance conditions. This term better than uh, I think is important to, to hold on to as it, because it clearly recognizes that things are changing, things will change, and that we ultimately can do something better than they currently exist. So fundamentally reclamation is not restoration. Why is that? Well operations in their very nature will reshape both the topography and ecology of the region. So as you can see here, over the course of operations and closure, you're going from a, you know, primarily a reduction of wetlands and lowland habitats and an increase of terrestrial shrublands, upland forests, etc. What this looks like over a kind of region, as you can see here in Suncor's Millennium Plan, is that over time from pre-disturbance to closure, we're seeing a fundamental change uh, in the landscape but one that provides an unprecedented opportunity in my mind to design for future land uses from the ground up. We're talking about 50 to 80 meters of excavation in some points, basically soil that needs to be put back and ultimately uh, we're in the position to really dictate how that's gonna happen. Zooming out a little bit over the entire SMA, uh, what we see here as illustrated by Shuttleworth is a series of end pit lakes and man-made streams um, and ultimately uh, an augmented landscape that looks and sounds much like the pre-disturbance conditions. But what's conspicuously absent uh, on this illustration is the urban reality. Uh, that being Fort McMurray as it currently exists. This, this red boundary here, it's urban growth boundary. I don't know if it was intentional or not, but just off the edge of the image. Likewise, Fort Mackay, the dead center of this region, and then beyond that, the roads that are connecting, you know, these, these towns, these populations to the project locations across the region. So Highway 63 as it exists, as it will be extended. And likewise, uh, the highways that are, that are currently on the boards with the province that will encircle the SMA and basically service all the project locations. So fundamentally, the, the landscape of the future has to recognize that the patterns of transportation and urbanization are a part of it. Uh, likewise, that these, these patterns are going to grow and expand in the future. I mean, this is 2012 at the edge of Fort Mac. You can already see aggressively, you know, population growth moving towards the SMA. 
uh, that this growth will will continue. I mean, this is this is the production curve uh, put out by industry, and in parallel, you've got an analogous curve of population growth. So, you know, today we're at about 125 unofficially, but that's set to double over the next few decades. So, we need to understand that this growth is a part of the landscape. That it's not that human beings are going to be there long term. Um, Fort McMurray already understands this, and it be, it's beginning to see itself and reframe itself as more than just a one-horse town. That the long-term employment me, means long-term investment. Uh, likewise, uh, its leadership, here the words of its own mayor, uh, that this community wants to invest in structures that give opportunities for the future, and that they want to be, apply the best practices to become a global model of sustainable living in the north. So we're not just talking about remote outposts, we're talking about a city, a city with ambitions. So here you see that city on the, on just on the, the bottom right part of the slide here in relation to the oil sands. And we need to understand therefore that reclamation is an enormous opportunity to design from the ground up. That reclamation is the creation of ecologically and socially sustainable landscapes. That reclamation shapes a diverse set of future land uses. And that reclamation ultimately is the creation of landscapes better than predisturbance conditions that can support future generations. So to begin uh, how talking about how we're going to do this and how it fits into the existing, I guess, frameworks, I think it's, it's useful to look at um, recent land use planning uh, in the province. Specifically, the Lower Athabasca Regional Plan issued in 2012 and the CRISP, the Comprehensive Regional Infrastructure Sustainability Plan uh, issued in 2011. Now, the LARP, uh, as, it's, as it's known, um, largely sets out the future land uses of the area. And as you can see here, the majority of what it's doing is setting out new green areas, new conservation areas that connect existing provincial and federal lands in and around the surface mineable area. What's interesting to me is that the term green area applied to this large white swath applies entirely to the surface mineable area. And it really leaves the door open for, I mean, I think invention and innovative uses and also kind of new uses, uh, industrial, commercial, etc. cetera. Um, and the language of the LARP supports this. As you can see here, reclamation for them will be used to help achieve the region's desired economic, environmental, and social outcomes. That opportunities will arise to reconnect lands and to help uh, achieve regional objectives related to biodiversity, recreation, and forestry. So you can see here the province beginning to recognize new uses, new industries, new forms of economy happening on these landscapes, and ultimately them being tied not only to environmental needs, but economic and social needs. The CRISP, on the other hand, is largely a transportation and servicing plan uh, that I had a part of putting together back in 2011. And what, what its overall goal is to do is to help, help growth in the region and, and really build infrastructure in advance of need. Um, so here you can see a series of new transportation corridors that are planned that, that offset the demands of Highway 63 already, then encircle the SMA, and that connect Fort McMurray, Fort Mackay, and the whole region east to Saskatchewan, west to Peace River, and north to Fort Chip and beyond, to, Fort, to, to the Northwest Territories and none of it. So ultimately what CRISP is doing in combination with LARP is that it's repositioning both the surface mineable area and Fort McMurray to become a diverse, productive, and, and service providing center for Canada's northern, uh, growing northern population. Now, uh, what this might look like or how to begin to think about how this landscape can be transformed, I think it's useful to look at uh, existing practices elsewhere. Uh, most notably here in the Lusatia area in Germany. So after years of surface mining, that's been a century, basically a century old industry that's still ongoing, um, rec faced with a series of, of, of closures and landscapes that, that required closure planning, a larger body was put together under the auspices of the IBA uh, to ultimately create a plan for the entire region. And this transformation uh, recognized that it was going to take a lot of time, it was going to take decades, and that its overall uh, idea was to create the future rather than simply waiting for it. So the project area, kind of give it some context, as you can see here, there's a series of end pit lakes of former mined areas, there's active mines, there's agricultural areas, and notably there's a series of towns and communities interspersed within this landscape. 
Uh, I'd also like to uh, highlight the red area here called the Wellzo Energy Ring, which I'll, I'll speak to in a second. As a comparison uh, in scale, on the left, you've got the IBA, uh, about a fifth of the size of, of the AOSA surface mineable area. Now, all this to say, if they can do this in Germany, there's absolutely no reason we can't do this in Northern Alberta. This is how they currently market themselves. So what we're seeing here is a mine uh, 10 years ago, and now it's being marketed as Germany's Lake District. Likewise, uh, here's an image 40 years into the future. This is for a lake that isn't even a mine yet. So they're, they're beginning to understand their landscape in a different time scale altogether and are looking at the end, uh, the vision for the end use to really uh, inform how mine and closure planning happens in the short and long term. Likewise, the landscapes that are, that are left over, uh, they begin to occupy them differently. Here you can see some innovative housing that takes into account fluctuating water levels on one of the end pit lakes. People are now holidaying on what was a mine site, you know, five years ago. More than that, they recognize that the industry itself is a form of a, a touristic attraction. And not dissimilar to the oil sands currently, uh, but perhaps more openly, they encourage people to come to look at it, to understand it, and to really appreciate how the industrial process is very much a part of the landscape. Likewise, reclamation, and in this place is a fantastic sculptural lookout that get you 100 uh, feet up above the above grade to really give you a 360 degree panorama of the entire region uh, to understand both its active mining, active reclamation, and at a range of long-term uh, future uses. Uh, the energy rings I spoke about previously here, it also understands that an energy producing landscape can become an energy producing landscape. And here, quite simply, uh, just a, a photovoltaic array over reclaimed area to produce you know, electricity for the region. Uh, moreover, they're looking at uh, innovative uh, agroforestry techniques and, and, and the creation of biofuels. Um, give you a sense of the energy ring and what's going on. In 2008, you can see the active uh, surface mining as it's moving from basically from right to left. Uh, and the ring encompassing a series of agricultural areas, forests, and it being surrounded by communities such as Wells and Spremberg. Fast forward three years later, you can already see mining aggressively moving uh, to the west and leaving behind uh, a series of fanned out uh, reclamation areas that have already you know, taken hold uh, and, and become uh, used. The longer term plan for this, you know, nine years from now, is to look at how reclamation follows mining to produce a series of different programs, be it agricultural, uh, agroforestry for biofuel purposes, vineyards, viticulture, as well as recreational uh, areas through, the, through a lake, through uh, designated areas, etc., and how they connect to the communities around them through this kind of larger pedestrian and cycling uh, circuit. Moreover, uh, the energy production and its biofuel, I mean, they're German. They love to, you know, they, they love, love to show what they're doing and what the math is behind all of this. So here they're giving the public a clear and, and kind of transparent view of the plants that they're uh, employing, the techniques that they're using, the amount of energy that it, that it produces, how long it takes to grow, etc. So very much reclamation of future uses are a, a means of like informing the public and getting them on board with uh, what the long-term plans are. Moreover, they let you drive through it. Uh, so this is an image I took out the side of the car of the energy ring, of one of these long-term productive practical laboratories where they're testing plants and they're testing uh, soils to basically find the right mix for, for the reclamation. Now, you know, moving to the oil sands, um, what can this look like? Well, what I'm, what I'm seeking to do here is providing uh, some initial ideas or just, just to get the conversation started about how we could begin to look at land use planning and the future land use of, uh, um, of these areas. So I'm going to start with the Jack Pine mine, uh, Shell's Jack Pine. It's a good candidate for a case study. It's about the average size. It's early in its development, and uh, and it's got a closure plan in place that we can we can look to to tack onto. So here you see by 2050, this closure plan sets out a fairly you know as mining moves north, it sets out a series of cells of closed reclaimed uh, areas that that basically stem from the south into the north that follow the ongoing operations. 
Um, likewise, it's got its own airfield. It's connected to Highway 63 to the west, and it will eventually be connected to the eastern highway. So, a first scenario would be the kind of obvious one, which would be a provincial park. Um, you know, in scale comparisons, looking at other provincial parks in northern Alberta, we're looking at an area roughly twice that of the Long Lake uh, Provincial Park. Um, what I think is interesting about uh, a mine site as a park is that, again, these cells as they close can be, you know, uh, incrementally occupied and inhabited. Some of them could be public, some of them could be private. Uh, there can be a mix thereof. The end pet lakes can be designed, uh, their edge can be designed for, for various types of use, as, as can their depth. Um, so there's a lot of, I think there's a lot of room to design this landscape to create different park-like conditions. What this might look like, and here you go, a kind of very typical Albertan scene uh, in the winter, um, with, with operations in the distance still ongoing. So we, we couple, um, you know, recreational program with industrial with industrial activity. I think these things can coincide and coexist. A second scenario, I think borrowing uh, from the Germans here, is looking at agroforestry and biomass, alternative energies, you know, creating a new energy landscape out of the existing one. So again, as a scale comparison, we can see the Wellzo energy ring that was just shown, Jack Pine's twice that. So uh, I think again, like Wales, you start with uh, kind of R&D in the south, and as uh, as operations move north and reclamation moves, those that R&D can kind of you know multiply itself across the lease. Again, what that might look like and who might be involved in this? Well, you know, Shell and Energy Company already investing in renewables and alternative uh, alternatives has a landscape and an opportunity here that it can tailor to its own ends potentially. And finally, uh, this being Alberta and uh, residing in, a, in the municipality of Wood Buffalo, um, where you know my personal experience was noting, noticing that every truck going south was pretty much empty. Um, the reality is that, that Fort McMurray in the region will need to begin uh, addressing its own 100-mile diet. And I think that the landscape here, uh, you know, building on Syncrude's bison program, could really become a rangeland, uh, well, in Alberta terms, a large ranch. So looking at existing uh, rangeland uh, in, um, institutes that are out there, such as the U of A's, that's about 60 square kilometers. We've got Jack Pine, that's about four times the size of that. So again, invite institutions in, such as U of A, invite companies in early to have them test and hone their techniques that can be multiplied across the lease. And what that might look like long term, again here, where you've got multiple uses happening in the same perspective. You've got the ongoing production in the distance and in the foreground you've got wood buffalo, you've got ranching, you've got production and the oil sands. So anyways to conclude I think there's a there's a number of ways that we should begun, begin to look at this landscape to look at its future differently and to ultimately understand it as being um, occupied and inhabited by the people that that live and work there. Thank you.